I'm James Jolly and I'm thrilled to be sitting down and chatting with some of my musical heroes. Welcome to this episode of Music Makers, a series in which we get to meet some of the most talented musicians on the planet. Music of the French Baroque is extraordinarily rich and varied, but has only really emerged from the shadows in the past 40 or 50 years. And one musician who's been central in this rediscovery is the harpsichordist and conductor Christophe Rousset. I'm delighted that he's joining me for this episode of Music Makers. Well, welcome. When I'm, when I'm preparing these, these talks, I always like to think of each musician in their kind of their happy place, their ideal, perfect spot. And when I think of you, I think of you sitting at the harpsichord, surrounding, surrounded by musicians you've worked with for a long time. Maybe two or three performances into a run of a work that nobody has played in about 250 years, and now it's coming back to life. I mean, is that, a, is, that, is that your happy place, or have I got it horribly wrong? Well, it's part of it, um, because I, I feel a lot of nostalgia for, for past years, for past in general, for Baroque era, and, uh, and my, my flat in Paris is, is full of uh, pieces like old harpsichords, uh, paintings, and so, and old uh, scores as well. And I do uh, consult them and, uh, and study them. But uh, I still feel quite a lot in my century. I feel, I feel quite uh, rooted in, in, in the present. So, so it's um, both of them, actually. I, 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 feel, uh, I feel my duty would be to just uh, make this bridge between, between the past and this music which is completely forgotten and the, uh, today's uh, audience. Because, I mean, one word that you hear a lot in France is the word patrimoine, mm -hmm. which um, there is an English equivalent, patrimony, but nobody really understands what that means. And it breaks down to things like heritage or inheritance. But here it seems to be quite a sort of strong concept. I mean, do you find sort of exploring your patrimoine, does that, does that energise you or, or make you work as it were well i i don't feel like uh, it is my patrimony mm. uh, it is um, for everybody actually uh, and uh, and it's um, it has to be known it has to be spread out and uh, and so that's and the, and the music is very special in in the sense that uh, if there is no performer the music doesn't exist so uh, I have the privilege to, uh, to be able to go to libraries, to hear the music when I read it, but it's not um, everybody can do that. Uh, so, so, um, so mostly people need a performer. And uh, I feel strongly that it's my duty to just deliver these beauties, sleeping beauties in libraries. Because it's, I mean, if one looks at sort of music of the French Baroque. Mm. I mean, it's performing tradition, actually, in, in a sort of, in a, in a historically informed way, doesn't actually go back terribly far. And it, it goes back, you know, if you look at the French taking over and looking after their own music from that period, only goes back maybe to possibly the 60s, and then it sort of it built up. I mean, it's quite interesting having a, a a relatively well, well, you can go back to the the end of the uh, 19th century, actually, mm. with Debussy, uh, with all those people, Dandy, uh, Saint Sans, opening Couperin's scores, uh, Rameau, uh, publishing the, the the complete Rameau stuff, uh, and uh, and Louis Diemer, who published uh, a lot of uh, harpsichord music for the piano, uh, in the Durand editions. And uh, and um, and you see some pictures of uh, Louis Diemer on the harpsichord playing with his friends Baroque music. So so this revival of uh, Baroque uh, music is actually from the end of uh, of 19th century. Then then it was it has been interrupted uh, during the wars, and uh, and probably uh, America uh, took over. 
and especially for the for the making of uh, old instruments, making copies. Uh, but uh, but at the end of uh, of the 19th century, uh, Gavot uh, made a, made a harpsichord in a perfect uh, idiomatic way. I mean, it was perfect. And then the idea of uh, adding pedals for Madame Landowska was uh, was much later in the in the 20s, 30s. And when, so when did this sort of the the pedagogical tradition of the harpsichord start in French, you know, in France, the sort of, you know, the kickstart of, an, you know, basically a new old instrument and then creating a school of harpsichord playing. Yeah, that was uh, Wanda Landowska coming from uh, Poland, but establishing herself in, in France, uh, having her school home and uh, and having, collecting old harpsichords and having these uh, playel uh, uh, monsters with pedals and, and metal looking, frames. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> looking like uh, like a piano, really. Uh, so she established this um, this uh, school of harpsichord, and uh, many people came from abroad, uh, like Ralph Kirkpatrick from America, Roger Ogerlin from uh, from Italy, uh, and many French uh, French players. Then. A new class of harpsichord opened in the in the conservatoire, and people like uh, Gad Dreyfus, who was my teacher, uh, started harpsichord, and uh, and that's that's how the revival uh, came to France. But uh, but of course, it's not uh, the same thing as England or or Germany or Basel in uh, in Switzerland or America. I mean, what characterizes the, the, a sort of French school of harpsichord Well, teaching? it was quite rigid, actually. <laughs> it was difficult to uh, to really uh, do something different than those uh, principles given by um, Landowska and uh, and uh, her school. Uh, and I had to just free myself and uh, and go abroad to uh, to have a. Fuller idea of the of the instrument, I think. and that's when you went to the Netherlands. Exactly, with Bob van Aspry. Exactly. That's and what was his approach? I mean, how how, was, how different was it? Well, um, to tell you the truth, I I went to one of his concerts in Paris, and I thought, mm, interesting, because I think I can learn a lot of things from him, but I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I had a very strong idea. I have a, I had a very, yes, yeah, strong, let's say, intuition of what the harpsichord should be. But I didn't have the keys to make the the instrument speak properly. And I knew uh, this uh, Dutch school would teach me how to uh, how to manage to make this instrument uh, eloquent. And so, would you say that your your harpsichord playing is a kind of blend of the Dutch and the French? But as you've been sort of, of playing many, solo for many, many years, yes, many, many things, and also my own vision of mm. uh, of, uh, of the instrument. Really, I when I listen to uh, to Dutch Dutch school now and Dutch players, I I feel very far from from their aesthetics. Uh, no, I've really elaborated my own language, uh, my own grammar on, on the harpsichord, and I, uh, and I teach a lot and I, I give this because I think it's, uh, it's a kind of a, of a discovery somehow, uh, having sh surely all those, uh, those um, elements inherited from Leonhardt, from Van Asperen, for, from Huguet Dreyfus sometimes also, uh, I mean, that's, that's a, yes. A synthesis. I would and can say. one still talk about particular schools nowadays? Because, you know, as we're in such a kind of, you know, borders are so fluid, you know, with internet, you know, with Spotify, you mm -hmm. can hear anything from anywhere. I mean, are, are sort of harpsichord styles melding a little bit? Because, you know, if you were in Japan, you mm -hmm. could listen to a Frenchman playing harpsichord or a Dutchman or an Englishman or whatever. Yes, I think it's more it's more the spirit mm -hmm. of, uh, of, uh, of a folk, of, uh, of, uh, of people. And, uh, and you feel very strongly when, when you listen 
Italian players or German players or English players or Spanish players or French players. It's not the same. It's not about schools, but it's more about the genius of the people. Do you think coming, because you're not a Parisian, you come from down south. Did, did, do you think that was an advantage when you came to Paris in that you were a sort of slight outsider, so you had that sort of slight distance, you weren't part of a, a kind of clique? Who knows? Perhaps, perhaps. I've never felt uh, being a part of this clique. Uh, and I always have been a, um, an outsider somehow. So perhaps that comes from, from being uh, um, provincial. But, um, but, uh, but I liked, of course, quite a lot Paris because, because that was a place where I could see so many things happening. So Leonhardt came to Paris, uh, uh, Christopher Hogwood came to Paris, and, and I remember very clearly all those moments. Uh, and there were like, you know, uh, new uh, light on the, the repertoire. And, uh, and uh, I saw the clique, the Parisian clique uh, around me uh, commenting. Um, and uh, and I, I just had my own view on, on this and my own appreciation. Mm. Because when I, when I was sort of, you know, doing my preparation and, and reading your biography and looking at all the various milestones, I was just thinking he was born absolutely the right time because you didn't, you didn't have to do the initial spade work. You know, a little bit of spade work had been done, mm -hmm. but the wave was beginning to kind of, that's a bit of a mixed metaphor, but, you know, the, the wave was moving up and you could ride that wave. And now, you know, 30 it's, years later. It's absolutely true. I, I have this strong feeling that's the preparation uh, was already done by, uh, by Leonhardt, by uh, Arnaud Cour, by uh, all the pioneers, but also by, by William Christie. I was uh, his assistant and I ben benefited, of course, of all this work before uh, I entered on, the, on, on stage. So, so that was, uh, that was uh, uh, probably the right moment. Uh, and also, I hardly fighted with instruments on, uh, for, my, for my tours in concerts. I had one very bad experience in Colombia, uh, having, having these uh, Landowska kind of, of instrument with pedals, and I, I thought, oh, I think I, I have my tendinitis before playing. But, uh, but uh, mostly I had good instruments uh, and I never had uh, bad surprises. While I guess all the harpsichordists before me had uh, terrible experiences because, because the, the I instruments were either not playable, either too, too difficult to play. So, uh, so I must say that I was, I was uh, quite fortunate in that sense. Yes. And presumably nowadays you just take your own instrument with you. Never. No, never. Mm, it's not like a violin player. Oh, it's right. complicated to uh, travel with a harpsichord, especially if it's old harpsichord. <laughs> so uh, were you involved in the, because a, a lot of people say that the, the Les Affleurys en production of Lully's Artis was a, a kind of, a sort of milestone in, in the, the sort of renaissance of French Baroque. Were you involved in that? I was actually the, the, the harpsichordist of the production and I was uh, Christie's assistant at that moment. And I learned a lot uh, on the repertoire, on Lully, of course, uh, on musical drama also. And I still have those images and those ideas of, uh, of the stage director, Jean-Marie Villegier, uh, still in my head. I, I've learned so much. So, um, so yeah, certainly it was, a, it was a big moment for all of us in France. Uh, it was not the first Baroque production. I've seen many things before, uh, like uh, Gardiner in, uh, in Aix-en-Provence or, or in uh, Lyon as well. Uh, of course, Jean-Claude Malgois was, was very active in uh, Tourcoing and toured also with uh, a lot of French uh, music. Um, so so uh, Les Arts Florissants were there. When I com came back from, uh, from uh, Holland, I went to a, a concert of uh, Les Arts Florissants and I was 
astonished. I, I, I thought, well, everything I've learned in Holland is not done in this concert, and yet I love it. So there must be something true in it, uh, and I have to find out what. So I, um, I approached Willem Christie, and I, I started accompanying his class in the Conservatoire in Paris, and then became his assistant. Be, uh, we founded this duet of two harpsichords, and we had uh, a very, very great time uh, together, uh, laughing a lot, uh, cooking together, and so many things. Um, and um, and um, I still have very, very strong memories of the, all these moments. And I must say, I have to be grateful to William Christie because he pushed me to uh, to become a conductor. I absolutely had no idea of, uh, no ambition to become a, a conductor. Uh, I remember Christopher Wood said, oh, you will be a conductor. And I said, mm -hmm. <laughs> do you think so? Well, I guess, I mean, in a way, his career sort of, you know, showed you that it could be done. Because, I mean, he, like you, he started off as a, a sort of scholar harpsichord. Yes, uh, but uh, but Christie as well. Uh, it 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 was it was yes a, a way to uh, to become a harpsic uh, uh, become a, a conductor. But uh, because it's quite natural to have music around the harpsichord. That was uh, that was even in the in the seventeenth eighteenth century quite normal to have the the harpsichord as the center the rhythm rhythmic center of the, of the orchestra of the group but um, but still I had n no ambition to to become a conductor uh, that was too big and I was I was I, I don't know it was it was easy it was comfortable to be just uh, in the green gray zone of the of the orchestra and just do the dirty job and uh, and and be uh, a nobody in the orchestra but the, the sort of repertoire you were doing actually it was fine. You could be, stay in the grey zone, as it were, in your orchestra. Mm. I mean, it's, it's it's only kind of later repertoires that sort of require you to step away. I mean, you know, there are certain repertoires you simply couldn't do from a harpsichord. I mean, you yes. couldn't conduct a Beethoven symphony. For Absolutely, example. and uh, and actually, the first opera I've conducted was uh, La Fée Urgelle in the Opera Comique in Paris with Les Florissants as an orchestra in the pit. And I had no harpsichord in front of me, and I felt so lonely. I felt really like, mm, what am I doing without my harpsichord in front of me? Um, but um, quite um, quite soon, I've conducted uh, late operas actually uh, from the from 1780s and um, Cimarosa, Martini del Sole, uh, Liomelli, Traetta, all those. Uh, all those unknown composers, and um, and uh, I I loved it. I thought I thought that was that was the 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 way I wanted to uh, to be a conductor. That's to say, discovering things, giving light on uh, on big uh, masterpieces uh, through unknown composers who would have influenced Mozart, Handel, uh, all the famous um, names of music. Because I always think it's one of the wonderful things about the work you and your colleagues do is that it's very easy to look at music history as just a series of kind of peaks, you know, mm -hmm. these enormous great, you know, mm -hmm. Handel, Bach, Mozart, mm -hmm. Beethoven, so on and so forth. Yeah. But actually what you guys do is you get, you come in closer and you suddenly realise that actually there are lots of little peaks between these two and those two. Yeah. And and actually, it gives us a sort of, you know, and it gives us a perspective when we see what also was going on. And you, and you sit there thinking, well, could Mozart have heard that? Or could Handel have heard that? Because, you know, and you just think, is it, is it part of a sort of zeitgeist and that sort of thing was happening? It's, it's actually, fascinating. Actually, you know that Mozart heard uh, Martini Soler because he mm. quotes uh, Cosarara in, in Don Giovanni. And, uh, and he knew, of course, of Salieri. And, uh, and my work on Salieri is, uh, is huge. I've, I've conducted so many Salieri operas. Uh, and I will, I will go on with, uh, with another drama giocoso very soon in, uh, in Vienna. Um, yes, it's, it's fascinating, actually, to, to, uh, to understand what influences 
came from Salieri on Mozart and came from Salieri on Schubert or Beethoven. Mm. Uh, well, it was amazing, all his pupils. I think he even took exactly. taught Liszt at one point, did he not? Really? Uh, I, I didn't know that, but, but, uh, but uh, for Schubert uh, quite, mm. uh, quite surely, and, uh, and he would have played the drums for, for the creation of the Seventh Symphony of Beethoven, can you imagine? So, so that was, that was a, a very fluid relationship with the, uh, all those uh, people in Vienna and, uh, and not, absolutely not the image uh, that uh, Milos Forman gave no. <laughs> of Salieri. <laughs> <laughs> so how much preparation is required? You know, if you, you, you find a Salieri score and you think, actually, this has got real merit, I think, I think it would work. Mm -hmm. I mean, talk us through the, the sort of process. I mean, presumably some of these scores you know, you may not have parts, or you may have. What, tell us. <laughs> well, the the most beautiful example was the Capriciosa Coretta uh, Martini Soler. So I was teaching actually in the in the in the academy, summer academy in Siena, Kijana, and I had the opportunity to go to the library. I found a score, uh, and I was like, mm, this score seems very interesting, and I found the Contessa aria from the Nozze di Figaro in it. And I thought, hmm, who knows if uh, Martini Soler was the first to, to write it, but um, actually not. But, uh, but this, this aria was taken from the Nozze di Figaro to just be part of, uh, of La, La Capricciosa Corretta. So I was very excited. I discovered that uh, Da Ponte was the libretto uh, uh, writer. Um, and uh, I, I found um, a way of producing this, this uh, work. Uh, first, I've published it with the, with the, the Societa de Autores in Madrid, so I had the possibility to publish it. Then we've done the production in, uh, in Lausanne uh, and in Teatro de la Sarsuela in Madrid. Um, and, uh, and and then we, we've done the recording for Naive. So, so that was the complete uh, achievement of a discovery. And that was really fascinating to see um, how from um, the act of reading a score in a library, then the, the idea comes and, uh, and you can realize the whole thing. And um, I loved it. Um, now I have much less time to go to libraries and, uh, and uh, many people come to me and just propose me scores uh, or projects uh, because they know I, I am the lawyer of disparate causes, you know? So, uh, so uh, they think I can save something or give justice to a, to a score which is completely forgotten. But I must say, it's, it's, it's in a way uh, much nicer for me to conduct a completely unknown piece. Because when you conduct, as, as I've conducted recently, uh, uh, Don Giovanni, you have every single singer has actually uh, sung the part before. Uh, so they know, because they've been taught by their teachers or maybe a, a previous conductor, how to sing it. So when you come, you give three, four ideas, but actually they never do them. Um, when you start conducting a, a new Salieri or a new Martini Soler or a new Lully uh, completely forgotten, uh, those singers have no idea, no clue, really nothing. And they're just read the notes and the blah, 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 like this, no, with no idea of, uh, of, uh, of the plot, of, uh, of what they say. <laughs> and, uh, and as a, a conductor, I do the dramaturgy, I explain what they sing, I uh, correct, of course, the, the pronunciation, uh, mostly in Italian or French, and then, and then I just try to, uh, to put fire to it, to just make it alive. And, um, and this job is much more interesting than just, you know, conducting for, 
for who knows how, how many times uh, the, 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 those singers have, uh, have sung uh, Don Giovanni. It's, uh, that's not as interesting, I must say. And presumably, it must be like conducting a new work. I mean, it, it's, it's a premiere, albeit 250 years after the one that may have happened or maybe didn't even happen. Exactly. But I think, as, as Armand Cour said, we, we all always do uh, uh, world premieres. And I think that's, that's the, the, the principle of, of uh, our practice on, on, uh, on original instruments. That's to say, we, we don't really care about what was done by by our predecessors. For instance, I've conducted recently uh, La Vestale, uh, Spontini, and I've, I didn't even listen to the Callas. Maybe I should now listen to Callas just to see how wrong she was. <laughs> but well, she uh, may have been, she may not have been wrong, but probably everybody else. Probably. But uh, no, but I mean, but the spirit was... I mean, the, the, of course, she was a fantastic performer and the role is terribly difficult so uh, but but um, but for me it was it was a premiere I, I, I must say I've opened the score I thought it uh, it's a wonderful uh, score and I have to just uh, make it uh, vibrate and uh, and alive and I've uh, I've tried to inspire the singers as much as I could with my enthusiasm did, I mean did it require much work doing to it or was the score more or less as it were good to go or no, you have to you have to put a lot uh, in it, and especially because there are a lot of uh, accompanied recits. And if you just do them as written, it's so boring. So you have really to uh, to uh, to inflate uh, a lot of uh, of ideas and uh, and uh, energy. And uh, yes, it's I use my intuition always and my intuition is always very strong so I, I just follow it <laughs> and uh, it's uh, it might sound a little presumptuous but uh, but it's uh, it's the way I uh, I make music and, and this is part of your your sort of 30th anniversary sort of season um, I mean if one let's wind the clock back to the start I mean did you have an aesthetic philosophy when you when you founded Les Talents Lyriques you know what you wanted to do you know what the parameters of your you know what is kind of fair game you know this sort of period what the kind of the relationship with, between you and your players would be I mean did you s sort of sit down and say this is why this is I what why my band is going to be like no I wanted I wanted to defend uh small French forms, like uh, small motets, mm -hmm. cantatas. Uh, really, I didn't, I didn't think I would ever have enough finances to, uh, to, to conduct a, a Rameau or a Lully opera. And I wanted to, uh, to discover the Neapolitan repertoire because I thought that was really interesting. And um, I... I started researching in, in those names like, uh, like uh, Yomelli, uh, Leonardo Leo, uh, Traetta, because of uh, uh, Domenico Scarlatti on harpsichord. I wanted to understand why Scarlatti was so different. So he sounded always very different on harpsichord, and I thought, what makes him so special? And uh, so I started uh, researching and, and I found fantastic music in this uh, Neapolitan repertoire. So I thought that will be my field also because nobody does it. And from that moment, of course, many Italian groups appeared and, uh, and started conducting these, uh, these composers. So it was less necessary, let's say. So I adapted a little and I had more and more opportunities of conducting on stage and Lully and Rameau came, uh, but also, see, I've conducted Faust by Gounod. I never expected one day Is I that would... the most modern piece you've done with your group? Or uh, was that 1868? As a, as a complete piece, yes, that's the modern. Uh, but uh, but we've uh, we've done in uh, tragedienne with uh, yeah. with uh, Veronique Jans even later like Massenet and uh, and Saint Sans. But um, 
at some point, you know, I, I, when I created the Talon Ligic, I thought uh, 1800 would be the limit because that's the moment where harpsichord disappears. Mm -hmm. But um, but then then I've uh, I've been asked to uh, to conduct uh, Mede uh, by Cherubini, and it was 1799, and I thought it was still okay. But actually, it's, it was not still okay because it's a very romantic piece. <laughs> it was huge and, uh, and very romantic. And I discovered my romantic soul uh, conducting uh, Cherubini. And then uh, when we've revived Cherubini in Brussels, uh, they've asked me to conduct the, the Third Symphony by Beethoven. And uh, it was very logical. And, uh, and you, do, you see, it's, it's, it happens. It's done, and and uh, and you think, well, yes, I loved it. Why not? And uh, and uh, so it, it it goes on and on. And uh, I never, I've never been uh, frightened by by a, a repertoire because I think there is always something new to say, and I uh, I hate routine. That's the thing I hate most. And w I just mentioned Don Giovanni when I conducted Don Giovanni, it was with a modern orchestra, and I had so much routine in the orchestra, it was terrible. So I've, I had to shake them to, uh, to, uh, to get what I wanted, what I had in my mind, and what I thought was right for, for this music to be alive. I mean, do you do much guest conducting with a modern orchestra? Not or, much, yeah. but I learned a lot uh, doing that because because my orchestra is a Rolls Royce somehow, mm. or even a Porsche because it goes fast, faster than I, you know, I'm like conducting and I say, oh, whoa, 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 not that fast. But an orchestra, a modern orchestra, a, a normal orchestra, is actually a. A very heavy mass, and people are often very passive in the in the in the pit or in the orchestra, and you have to move them, you have to lead them, you have to uh, to take them in your arms, and and really, uh, uh, it's it's a big big fatigue. Uh, but it's nice at the same time because when when you achieve something, you think, well, I've done it. Um, it's a it is, different it is, it is interesting, actually, how many sort of traditional opera orchestras now can actually sound very stylish in True. Handel operas, for example. True. I've conducted the Royal Opera House in, in uh, Mitridate and it sounded absolutely all right. <laughs> that was perfect. Uh, it depends on the on the conductor. Mm. I'm I'm sure it's the, just the imaginary, the the what 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 image you have in your head, and what you want to get from the orchestra. And when you have a fantastic opera uh, opera house uh, um, orchestra in your hands, of course they they respond. Uh, it's not always the case everywhere, but um, but uh, but nowadays yes, it's they are they are more trained to uh, to change their, their way of playing and uh, the, the sound image. Mm. But the one thing you wouldn't get from them, which you will get with, with your own orchestra, is presumably, you know, the minute you open a Lully score or a Rameau score, the orchestra just knows what to do. It knows what ornamentation it can do without... Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and it's, it's right that you mentioned French music, because French music is so specific, so idiomatic, uh, if you put this music in front of a, of a German orchestra, they, they, you know, they, they don't know how to move uh, in this uh, in, in this repertoire. Really, that's uh, it's so specific. With my orchestra, it's just a cup of tea. It's normal. It's just normal, mm. and they they can they can uh, they can react very easily. Uh, and and uh, when I when I change direction, find other ways. They follow me uh, in every detail. So obviously it's a, it's a luxury to have uh, his own, uh, my own orchestra. And presumably it also allows a spontaneity in performances that if you're doing a run of say six performances of a, a Lully opera, you can do things in performance three or four that you maybe didn't do before and the orchestra Absolutely. will be with you. 
Absolutely. And the nice thing, because we mentioned Lully, is that I play myself uh, the recits. I, of course, conduct the, the big masses when, when it's a, a, a chorus uh, or a, a dance music. But, uh, but uh, I, I play in the recits and I like uh, to feel the members of my orchestra listening carefully to what I do on the harpsichord. And, uh, and I, I feel this, uh, this uh, very horizontal energy. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't like the idea of being a conductor in the vertical mm. way. That's to say, you, you know, uh, doing my authority on the, harpsichord, uh, on, the, on, the, on the orchestra just from above and uh, scratching them down. Uh, saying it's my way. That's not my way of, of, uh, of conducting. I prefer to be part of them. And, uh, and it's the same thing when I conducted Mitridate in, uh, in Covent Garden. I played the, the, the recits and I was part of the orchestra somehow. And I think it changes the... It the... must change the dynamic because exactly. you are another musician exactly. alongside. So you you have a different kind of respect from mm. from the players. Yeah, because it's even I mean even you know with a modern orchestra and you have a a great pianist who is a conductor. Mm. Even then, it's slightly different because they know he actually could sit down and exactly. play the piano exactly. brilliantly well. Exactly, that's uh, that makes a difference. Yeah. So was sound one of the? I mean, the sound of your orchestra was it was when you created it. Was there a particular sound you wanted? You know. That, that would set yours apart? Uh, probably not. Uh, when I listen to my old recordings, when it happens, because I hardly listen to myself, uh, when it happens, I'm surprised because I, I still like it, but, uh, but I think, you know, I, I feel strongly that I wouldn't uh, do the same way. Uh, because... Nobody is born a conductor, actually. Uh, not even Karayan, I guess. So you you uh, you get to know how to conduct, uh, and to just have in your mind more precisely what you want to get from the orchestra, and uh, and the more you conduct, the the more. Uh, precise the ideas are and uh, the, the most you, you find the keys to just achieve what you have in your head uh, and that's how it happened and, uh, and now I have no problems to get exactly what I want and, uh, and I can insist and, uh, and, uh, and just stop my orchestra forever till the moment I obtain exactly what I have in my head. But probably that was not the case when I, uh, when I created my group because, because, you know, people are around you and they know how to play this music and you just trust them uh, and you, you don't know how much you can impose your views. Uh, but uh, but the, more, the more you conduct, the more, the more I, I became uh, difficult in that way, I must say. I, I, uh, wanting to just go into the right point I had in my, in my head. And is there a sort of core orchestra, the people who kind of have been with you most of the journey, and then you add to it for different repertoires? I mean, you know, if you're going to do an eroica, you would probably need some extra strings, or if you're going to do a, a masne or you yes. need some. Yes, true, but uh, but uh, let's say that there are freelancers like mm. uh, like uh, in almost every uh, period instruments orchestra in in the world, so uh, so they they go here and there and they choose uh, with whom they want to play, and uh, and sometimes you don't have the those players uh, uh, available, so you have to change and you discover new players. But uh, but I like to have a good balance between between my, let's say, uh, core uh, of, of players and, and uh, young, new talents, mm -hmm. uh, because it's nice to have uh, this young energy also in the, in, in the orchestra. And when it comes to the instruments, I mean, do the, because, you know, people often think that sort of period orchestras have a very narrow, um, you know, sort of repertoire, you know, 
But actually, if you look at your repertoire, it runs roughly from sort of Monteverdi to Guno. So, I mean, that's, you know, that's a very, very long time. And actually, instruments have changed over the years. Absolutely. But, uh, but it was very touching when, uh, when I've uh, launched the, the, the project of, uh, of, uh, of Faust uh, to see how the players were, were enthusiastic and started finding the right instruments, the right bows for the, for the double basses, for the, for the, the violins, uh, the right uh, pitch also. Uh, we had to decide so many things, um, but it was, uh, it was also their challenge. It was not only mine, and that was very touching. I, I must say, it was, um, I thought, instead of, uh, of you know, being a, a real French, typical, mumbling uh, attitude, it was, um, they were very enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. I mean, one, one organization we, we, we should talk about, because they have been quite involved and, and, and helped you over the last, is the Palazzetto Bruzzane. Because they have basically unlocked the the possibility to, to explore some of these incredible pieces. Yes, uh, yes, I'm very grateful to them. Uh, well, they've they've proposed me uh, the the, the Gounod, uh, but also La Vestale, the Spontini project I've just just uh, finished, um, and they have the found. That's the that's the thing. That it it makes the whole project possible so um, so of course it's a, it's a, it's a fantastic opportunity for us uh, and um, as they trust me uh, they know that they, they see me uh, at work they see how much i can get from the singers uh, how much drama i like to have in uh, in my uh, in in my performances so um, so They've given me a, a new uh, a new project, uh, Louise Bertin. I'm sure you never heard this name before. Uh, so she's uh, she's a composer of the beginning of the uh, 19th century. She was very famous in Paris because he's, uh, her father was uh, was uh, was a, a, a journalist in Paris, very famous, and um, and she created uh, her Faust also in uh, in uh, Paris, Les Italiens. And uh, created in it, in Italian this opera, and um, and uh, her name was not mentioned, but everybody knew that was that was a woman uh, who who wrote that opera, and uh, that made made a, a big um, big buzz on the, on this uh, this opera. It's it's quite fascinating, I must say. So that's, this is the ne next project for Buzane. Uh, with great singers, uh, we have uh, Karina Gauvin, Karine Dehaye, uh, and a uh, big team. Um, and it's a huge, huge project, huge orchestra, really ambitious. I mean, what does what does the music sound like? I mean, is it is it easy to place it? Mm, it's it's really uh, around the the 1830s, so it's quite typical of the period. It, uh, it, is, uh, it, it, it is quite ambitious uh, and has influences even from Mozart, but mostly from Weber on, and these, uh, these people. It, sound, it sounds special. I can't, I can't say much more. I, I, I have to study more the, the score. You, I mean, you mentioned some of the singers involved. I mean, one of the interesting things is, is during your career and during the period I've been sort of listening to the music that you've, you've been making, is that there seems to be a whole generation of French singers who now champion, in, champion their own native music. I mean, you know, when one goes back, there were an awful lot of sort of import, but now there's a, there is a distinct French school of early singing which is lovely to hear yes but but it, it's not just uh, early singing no <laughs> and uh, and uh, the 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 best examples are veronique jeans and uh, and sandrine pio they are they are incredible because they they still sing uh, wonderfully and uh, they've started um, with me in the in the in the 80s uh, so that they are there are models uh, for many singers in uh, in France, um, and um, and 
Yes, there are, there are new new uh, French talents. Uh, there there is now uh, a French school for for singing. While uh, in the in the seventies, that was uh, quite a hole. Nobody was really uh, uh, in the spotlights. Uh, we had uh, Regine Crespin, and uh, and then. Um, Maybe Jeanne Berbier, uh, but, but who else? Eda Pierre. Uh, there were very isolated cases, but uh, but now we we really have a, a very good uh, French French school for singing. So so um, it's quite encouraging. And it, it it's it, it does make a difference hearing somebody singing in their own language. Absolutely. Particularly French. Absolutely. French is quite difficult. For Italians, for uh, I must say, English people or American people sing quite well in French. While uh, Italians, Spanish people, oof, it's always very, uh, very painful because because the the accent is always very strong and and you can't you can't really uh, stand it as a, as a, as a as a French listener uh, having a, a too strong accent. Mm. And how far do you think, I mean, what's interesting, you know, looking at your repertoire is the way, you, you know, you've, you've not made huge jumps, you've sort of worked very gradually through the repertoire and there's a sort of organic feeling. I mean, how far do you think it would, could t I mean, could you see yourself conducting P Pelias et Melisande, for example? Yes, I was, uh, I was about to name uh, Pelias. Yes, it's a, it's a piece I, I love and uh, it's a piece I have been proposed to conduct in, uh, in Russia a long time ago, and I said, no. No, because I love Pelias et Mélisande, and I don't think <laughs> I, would, I would help this music. But, uh, but now I think I, uh, I, would, I would accept the proposal. Uh, how far? I, I don't know. I've, I've even conducted... Uh, um, uh, Germain Taifer, for instance. So th that's quite that's that's probably the the most recent. But that was not with with a uh, Italian lyric. It was with a uh, with a modern orchestra. Mm -hmm. I mean, education is something that you, you you've become increasingly interested in. I mean, how how do you see your role sort of educating? Is it is it just connecting young people with music, or is it more specific? Well, there are two aspects. I've been I've been uh, teaching at the uh, Paris Conservatoire for years, harpsichord, and then and then in master classes I've mentioned uh, Kijana in Siena, but I, I still uh, teach quite a, a lot in master classes. That's for harpsichord, and then we have these programs of uh, of going to schools in uh, in uh, in France, in Paris especially, to uh, to just. Um, Spread the beauty and uh, and try to uh, to just um, awake uh, an interest in uh, in those young people. Just just see how it works and and actually it works quite well. They 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 love it, especially when they are not too old, around twelve, thirteen. That's still all right. Later, they just refuse everything, so baroque music is just impossible for them. But uh, but before, they 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 are very open and very um, receptive, and uh, we had very touching um, reactions of them. Uh, and then the the field can be very open. They they sometimes they they record, they film, the 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 they they, they make interviews. Um, uh, and they've they've been bro broadcasted by France Music here in uh, in uh, in Paris. Uh, they, 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 um, so the, it's it's uh, it's quite uh, quite a nice experience for them as well because they are not just listeners; they are also active. Uh, we've created also the young orchestra of Les Talents Lyriques, so they they are taught how to play an instrument. Of course, they are they are not in big levels, but they. We can make concerts, and uh, and uh, so they are active in music, and that's the the, the most touching aspect, I I would say. Uh, 
sometimes it's a, a show that it's uh, it's staged some 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 sometimes uh, sometimes they sing as well so um, so that's um, I think that it, it's important it's not necessarily opening to a, a new audience because possibly they they won't come very often to uh, to a concert but uh, those young people don't imagine it's for them. They think it's uh, for an elite, and and they don't they don't feel like uh, like being part of it. Uh, but uh, but uh, with us, they come to uh, to the Théâtre des Champs Élysées, to the Paris Opera House, and uh, and uh, they they come to rehearsals. And uh, and they've they've been introduced to the pieces, so they are, they have really a a, a good uh, way of listening the music, and uh, always the, the 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 reaction is very positive. Because there's positive. also that element, isn't there, that if if kids are ex exposed to music, I mean, particularly when music is done very well, mm. it plants a seed that even if they they go away and they listen to rock music or whatever for the rest of their life. That little seed will always be in there. I think so. I think so. It's just access to beauty. I think it's uh, is is important. Is important. I remember the one of, of the kids uh, asking me, "Oh, you are you are performing in Versailles? Uh, uh, is it is it uh, your your home? Is it your place?" I said, "Well, it's your place as well. I mean, it's our place. Uh, it belongs to us. So uh, come and uh, and uh, come to your place." Uh, but uh, but you know it's uh, it's um, it's a way of of uh, having a, a f this fluid uh, conversation with these uh, these young people, and um, and they they like uh, they like seeing you on YouTube, for instance. I've seen you on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> you are famous. Yes. Uh, well, I, I am with you, <laughs> and that's uh, that's uh, that's a very nice experience, I must say. I mean, you talked about exposing people to beauty. I mean, at the at the core of what you do as an artist, I mean, is that something you feel is your mission to expose people to music and to beauty? And if that's the case, is there something curative about it? Does it make the world a better place? Hopefully, it's <laughs> it's a it's a it's a nice concept. Uh, I I would uh, love to believe in it. Uh, it's it's mostly um, a personal uh, hygiene for me myself to to be surrounded by beauty and to uh, to just uh, to just uh, yes try to uh, to uh, spread beauty around me and uh, yeah it's 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 necessary it's necessary to uh, to just um, forget about about the the ugly things around us and uh, and it's not that complicated you can just go to a to a museum you can open a book you can uh, listen to uh, classical music it's very easy it's very accessible and uh, most of people think it's not for them and that's uh, that's a big pity just one of the wonderful things about going to a concert or an opera is that you are shut off from the outside world, generally speaking, I mean, unless you're on your phone. Um, and everything ceases to sort of matter except, hopefully, what happens within those four walls over the next two or three hours. Yes, that's, uh, that's a very interesting aspect. The temporality, the, the concept of time, how to use it. Uh, how to stop time when you uh, when you play, and I love uh, especially being alone on my harpsichord in concerts to just stop the time and try to impose silence, playing very slowly and um, and quietly, uh, and I think it's it's also something you can achieve with a, with an orchestra with. A, with the special atmosphere you create and uh, just suspend this idea of time uh, which is which is uh, terribly um, present in our lives too much pressure so perhaps with music you can have this uh, healthy perception because <laughs> you can take people outside time but actually you can also take them 
on a journey. And I always wonder why, why a work like Bach's Goldberg Variations seems to have a resonance outside the very specific classical world. You know, it's amazing. People say, oh, yes, I love the Glenn Gould recording or I love this. Mm. And then you think, well, why? But actually, it's, it's an incredible journey if somebody concentrates on it mm -hmm. because it's intellectually stimulating, I mean, immensely stimulating, but actually emotionally very satisfying too. Hopefully, I don't know how much pe people in general can get from uh, from listening uh, Goldberg variation or or well tempered clavier. Um, uh, Bach is a very interesting subject uh, because because it's um, it's uh, very intellectual, uh, it's very ab abstract, and the harpsichord is very abstract as well. So it's uh, it's something very demanding for an audience, I think. Um, but still, it has its fascination. It's somehow it 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 is operative on the, on people. It's it's uh, it's uh, it has the yes a very strong power. But probably a, a B minor mass by Bach also is a big 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 piece. It's very long, very demanding for the for the performers and probably very demanding for the for the audience as well but it is fascinating it has its fascination same for the passions because your, your next Matthew. season next year's season Matthew you are passion. taking the Matthew passion into yes. your repertoire for the first time I think. yes yes and that's uh, that's also a challenge for us but I must say also for the audience because because it's uh, it's it's not easy it's not uh, an easy piece of course it tells a story Everybody knows, but um, but still, I mean, it's very demanding. Um, it's interesting. It's interesting. Uh, I must confess, when I've uh, I've conducted the Sinjin Passion once, I thought uh, when when the crucial moment arrives, I thought maybe I should stop the performance to save the Christ, <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't. <laughs> because I mean, because they, I mean, the passions when done well, they have, they easily have the power of a great opera performance without having the sort of. I mean, yes, you can stage them, but you don't need to you stage don't need them to. because the narrative is so strong. Yes. The story is told so beautifully the way it's unfurled, and the and the drama is t taken over by by the composer, while uh, it's not always the case in opera, <laughs> because the construction of the passions. Uh, is uh, is uh, is incredible the, the the way he alternates uh, recits and uh, and uh, choruses uh, chorals um, uh, solo arias um, in in operas you you really have to to uh, to create this drama and to uh, to try to uh, to um, yes um, find a way to uh, to uh, combine those elements in order to create the moment of, uh, of, uh, of drama you want. But I like that. I, uh, I must say that, uh, that uh, conducting a Monteverdi or a Lully or a Gluck uh, is, uh, is a challenge because it's not easy as the music is, uh, can seem very plain or uh, quiet and, uh, and uh, doesn't really say where in what which direction to go but uh, but then it's very uh, flexible and it it allows you so many possibilities and uh, that I love and presumably if you find a director whose vision of the piece chimes with yours then it must be even better or not, or and not. then <laughs> and then it gives you new uh, new ways and uh, new vision and uh, and perhaps gives you new ideas. Uh, I must say that uh, I've almost never been I have never been uh, inspired by uh, by colleagues, uh, nor singers, nor uh, or or players, uh, but I've. Always have been very imp inspired by uh, by stage uh, directors, 
because they have visions of the world, they have their own uh, imaginary, and, uh, and, uh, and that fascinates. Uh, that fascinates me. Uh, that really opens me new, uh, new ways of thinking the world, uh, thinking the, the piece of art, uh, thinking how to move in a, in a different way. In an opera, I already know so well, and, uh, and well, it's a new light and, uh, and gives you uh, new inspiration. That's, uh, that's very important. Because there's, I mean, there are some directors, and even if you didn't know they were very good musicians in their own right, or they have an intuitive grasp of musician, when you watch the show, it kind of comes across. You think, gosh, this person works with the music, not against the music. True, true. But sometimes it, it works against, and, uh, and, uh, and that's sometimes very pa painful to conduct those, uh, those shows. But, um, but it's the way it is. Uh, nowadays, the, the stage directors have more light than the, than the music. So they have, um, they have the, the event is actually the, the staging and not, not the music. Mm. Well, I mean, we've talked a lot about you know, the way um, musical approaches have changed and developed. And all, but the constant throughout this is, is the audience. But I get the feeling that audiences have changed, have grown. Have, have become very knowledgeable. I mean, you interact with audiences or you must encounter audiences after shows regularly. I mean, do you feel that people, you know, because now we've got a whole, you know, we've almost got a whole new audience for Baroque opera and it's almost their speciality. Oh yes, I, I go everything or whatever, you know. Yes, possible, possible. My, my worry is that uh, that's, um, that it's too specialized, and uh, it's it's always better than than things open to a wider audience and not a specialized audience, and uh, and I uh, I'm worried also of having uh, too many of uh, sixty people in the audience. So, you know, it's uh, it's um, it's a problem. I hope I hope new generation will get. Uh, interested in in this uh, in this repertoire as well um, we have so many young players young performers the the, the music schools are full of uh, of young people young talents and uh, and there are many many good new uh, harpsichordists especially in France it's uh, quite amazing um, I, I wish we would have also a new audience. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure about it, but, um, but we are working on it, uh, especially in France. Some, some countries are a little asleep. I think that we should, we should really all worry about, about new, uh, new audiences and uh, to refresh uh, a little. But it's true that uh, that's the, the audience for Baroque music is mostly younger. Mm than the normal repertoire. Because, mm. I mean, it's, 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 it's heartening that there are, you know, quite a, a few, what would say, big stars, you know, in opera in general, who are increasingly interested in Baroque opera. And they will always make sure yeah. that every year, you know, there is one or two seriously big Baroque opera roles that they do. It's true. It's true. And that's a good sign. Yeah. That's a good sign. And you see the same... Um, uh, Phenomena in uh, in um, festivals and in uh, in opera houses, uh, the Baroque titles are actually pushing doors and uh, <laughs> uh, inviting themselves in the in those uh, in those uh, opera houses, and that's that's a very very good sign for us, absolutely. Because mm. I mean, one of the, the things that I always think is is amusing and heartening at the same time is because so many Baroque operas are based on classical themes. You suddenly, when you actually reduce it to the sort of archetypes, you realise how constantly relevant they are. You know, the squabbling with gods and mortals, and it's very easy to overlay that onto what's happening in the world around us, which means that they speak very directly. Yes, well, uh, it was, it was uh, surprising to see the response, for instance, in, uh, in La Scala. We've, uh, we've done uh, Callisto recently with... Uh, David McVicker uh, in La Scala, and uh, and people were surprised how the libretto was modern. 
uh, and probably more interesting than uh, a bel canto libretto <laughs> yes. and the and the uh, the, the staging of David Knight Vicar was brilliant. So, so it has been a big success at La Scala, and it was quite unexpected, I must say, between a, a Verdi and a Rossini. Now, recordings have, have played a huge role in your life. I mean, you have a vast, I mean, we probably shouldn't even call them discographers these days, a vast catalogue. <laughs> I mean, how, how important is recording for you? Well, for, on a harpsichord is the... I, I always use a, an original instrument uh, calibrated for the repertoire, the specific repertoire I've, uh, I've chosen. And, uh, and uh, that's, that's a way of, uh, of uh, making accessible a sound um, for a very wide audience. Of, often those original instruments are in museum or private collections and they are not uh, possible to be heard for, for a wide audience. So, so that's, that is my, uh, my, um, my goal, recording them. And, and also because, because harpsichord is, um, is a complicated instrument and I liked having the perfection in a recording. Uh, maybe you never achieve in concerts. Finally, in recording, you can have exactly what you want. So that's something I, I like. Uh, it's a kind of a laboratoire, labor laboratory uh, work. For uh, with my orchestra, I like I like to uh, to do a non repertoire, and I think it's it's important when you when you. Uh, perform a Salieri opera for the first time or a Martini Soler or who knows what. Um, it's important to have a recording just to, uh, to also make it accessible for American audience, Japanese audience, um, scholars working on that specific subject. Uh, and and in this uh, in this way, uh, our recordings are successful because because there are new things, so it calls the interest uh, more than doing a, a new uh, Mozart Requiem or a, a new set of uh, Beethoven symphonies. And I'd imagine it also gives it also gives a kind of impetus to putting on. You know, if you're if you're going to prepare an opera for say a concert performance, you're only going to do it once or twice. To have the fact that it's being recorded gives it an extra justification. So it's not just here and gone. And... For us, yes, but uh, but is it necessary? And that's the that's the question. And uh, and that's why that's why we prefer to record uh, unpublished uh, operas. So so it has a sense. It has a sense because it has. Uh, uh, let's say um, it's um, it's necessary in a way to uh, to have a, uh, a new space in a in a, in a library or in a... Mm. <laughs> um, uh, uh, to, to close I have a, a non well I think it would be a non musical question but if you weren't a musician what what profession do you think would have attracted you well I uh, I I had this idea of being an archaeologist when I was a, was a child, and I'm still fascinated. And I uh, I will go to Greece this summer, and I want to see some uh, Greek ruins. And uh, the same, I will go to Paestum in uh, near Naples this summer. And I always feel so strongly uh, the fascination of uh, of the past. I don't know. What in in myself is uh, is so fascinated by uh, by those uh, those times? Um, it's like a le lost Eden, probably. Uh, so a nostalgic uh, part of uh, of myself. But um, but probably yes, the the the, the magic finding a, an object and opening to new views of. Uh, of uh, a lost um, civilization or a, a past uh, life uh, time, that's that's something something which uh, fascinates me quite a lot. I must say.
Well, uh, at least for the time being, uh, the musical world has its grips on you and uh, hopefully we'll hear you performing for many, many, many more years to come. Hopefully. Christoph, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much thank for your you, time. James. Thank you. Are you more comfortable surrounded by noise or silence? Oh, silence. If you could choose the sound of your doorbell, what would it be? Or your ringtone? The voice of a kid, probably. What is the sound you wake up to? Uh, you mean uh, in real, real life? Or... Real life. <laughs> probably the, the, the footsteps of my neighbours uh, above my head. If your life was a movie, what would your theme song be? Mm, something very romantic. Let's see. <laughs> Perhaps a piano concerto by Mozart or something like that. What to you is the most relaxing sound? The waves on the ocean, probably. And, and what's the most irritating sound you can hear? Works in the street. What sound reminds you of home? I'm born in, in south of France, so, so what is uh, about uh, the sound of, uh, of summer in, in Provence, the cigale. Mm. What's the first sound you remember hearing? I don't remember, but it should have been the voice of my mother, I guess. <laughs> um, what, what sound makes you think immediately of a, of a happy memory or a happy place? Probably wood cracking like uh, a staircase, uh, a piece of furniture cracking. What is for you the most musical sound not made by an instrument? Bird. Bird, yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs>